Hi everybody, and welcome to another edition of In a Heartbeat. I'm your host, John Clore, and today I think we've got something that you'll really be surprised when you get into the minutia of what we're going to talk about. You know, when we think about Detroit, we think about manufacturing. I mean, this town is built on the auto industry, and every time we uh, have anyone discussed Detroit, they talk, talk about the might of uh, the arsenal of democracy and the motor city. Well, what we don't think about is how the manufacturing really does affect us in all of our lives in a much different way than just cars. And as a matter of fact, it, uh, it really does affect people that m may not even be aware that manufacturing is involved in the medical industry. So today, we've got a very special guest. Uh, the guy I'm going to introduce to you is uh, not sp just special because of his knowledge. He's special because in my life, uh, this is a guy who started uh, me on my path to my career at 15 years at the Detroit News. Uh, he was my boss there, and then I followed him to Auto Week magazine, uh, followed him over to Ford Motor Company. We've kind of been chasing each other around in our careers for the last 35, 40 years. So I'm really pleased to bring you today Jim Sawyer, uh, James, thank you so much for joining us. Jim is now senior editor over at the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. <clears throat> and uh, even though, Jim, I haven't followed you over there <laughs> as of yet, but I can tell you this, that uh, they've got themselves a real gem. I'm really pleased thank to you. have you here today, Jim, because I think that <clears throat> a lot of people, when, I, when you think of manufacturing, you don't really think of the medical field. And when we, you and I talked, we said, you know, Jim, uh, when you talk about medical manufacturing, you're talking about how those guys put the cotton on the end of the Q-tip, and you remember you laughed about that, and I said, or you're talking about just how they make aspirin and pills and the pharma, and we kind of laughed about it, and then when I got into the discussion with you, I found out that it's, it's much, much more than that. But before we get into that, Jim, tell me about the Society of Manufacturing Engineers and about their yearbook program. Well, the Society was founded nearly 80 years ago. Um, to increase and uh, spread the knowledge of manufacturing. Um, we, we think we're so high tech now, but every era has its own developing technology. And 80 years ago, uh, for the auto industry and for other industries, um, people in manufacturing realized that the more they could get the, the word out, the more they could manufacture, the better they could manufacture it. And in the 1930s, an economy very much like what we have today, it was a benefit to be able to think that we can do things better, faster, cheaper. So the, the society was formed. Uh, we are located in Dearborn, Michigan on land that was uh, uh, provided to the society by the original Henry Ford. Wow. Um, and uh, our, our goal, we like to say our goal is to uh, provide, with member, provide members with three things. Okay. Meet, no grow. Everyone you need to meet to learn more about manufacturing, how to manufacture better. Um, everything you need to know about manufacturing and everything you need to know in your profession in manufacturing. So while it says engineering there in right. our name, not everyone is, a, is an engineer or a practicing engineer. Some are machinists on the shop floor, mm -hmm. some are executives, but they all uh, come to us because they have needs in, in those areas to meet the right people, to know the right things, and to grow uh, their knowledge and their business in manufacturing. So the, uh, one of the ways to communicate then that growth would be through the establishment of a yearbook and uh, as a member benefit. Now, the, the society, though, covers uh, many different aspects of engineering, medical just being one of them. Why don't you go over, like, what... Uh, different yearbooks that the society uses and, and your role in that? The yearbooks grew out of Manufacturing Engineering Magazine, which oh, is okay. our monthly magazine for members and for okay. uh, qualified subscribers. And our publisher, Greg Sheremet, um, had the idea that we would focus on four key industries that are important to the society. Okay. Those are medical, aerospace and defense, motorized vehicle and energy manufacturing. Wow. So the first uh, yearbook came out in 2006 um, on aerospace and defense. We're putting together the 2011 version right now. In 07, the medical manufacturing uh, yearbook was added. In um, 2009, we added motorized vehicle manufacturing. And last year, we added energy manufacturing. 
and this year we said enough. We got four of them. And, uh, <laughs> That's why they got Jim Sawyer. You, well, I have to tell you, uh, when I first picked up the, uh, the yearbook and to go over the kinds of things you'd find, it, it's kind of fascinating. You'd never expect that uh, our medical manufacturing business is uh, so widespread it doesn't even come into your mind the, the kinds of things that are being done today in this industry and that's why it was kind of important for me to sit down with Jim and talk to him about uh, the yearbook. So Jim, let's talk a little bit about uh, that manufacturing industry. I don't think when people think of medical, uh, they think about going to the hospital or the doctor's office, they don't really think about manufacturing. Like what the heck, is it, other than the pill or you know the, uh, you know, the little uh, tongue depressors, I mean what are we talking about when we talk about medical manufacturing? Medical manufacturing is today far more sophisticated than those three items <laughs> you mentioned. Um, they include machines with which CAT scans are performed, MRI, X-rays, uh, all the instruments that doctors use. It, it includes uh, the prostheses, the orthopedic devices, hip implants, knee implants. All these things are manufactured. It, it includes pills, yes. There, there are uh, very so sophisticated machines used at pharmaceutical companies to fill these little gel caps with all the various powders and chemicals mm -hmm. that go in there. But it, it's much, much more. It's everything from uh, bedpans to wheelchairs to the hover rounds advertised on TV right. uh, to the orthopedic devices that are implanted, artificial hearts, all these things. That's all, it all needs to be made. Now when we talked about it, Jim, uh, you know, <laughs> you think about what you might have in your house that's been manufactured by a, a company that's into the medical business. Maybe a set of crutches, maybe an arm sling, maybe you have, um, maybe you had shin splints and you've got the little plastic device. Uh, but we're talking about uh, really high-tech, expensive machinery. I know I was recently involved with a fundraiser whose job was to get a new um, MRI machine for a hospital. Uh, these machines are, are cutting edge and extremely expensive, and they have to be um, developed by seriously high-tech companies and engineers to make the, the very latest in, in some of our CAT scans and uh, mammogram machines, all the things that we are used to seeing in only the high-end hospitals. Is, is that high-end part of the business, is it really associated with the engineering community that closely? It is associated with engineering in, in two very basic ways. One is engineering design. Okay. Uh, someone has the idea, I would like a device that will do this. Okay. So an engineer has to design it to accomplish that end. Yeah. Then someone else has to say, yeah, but we're not going to make just one. Yeah. So how do we make them? How do we make them quickly and efficiently? Or what and is the business case, right? There, I mean, there's a business case. Okay. There's also something else that's very important. And that goes back to the, the Hippocratic oath that doctors take, and that is do no harm. These things have to be safe. Okay. They, they have a goal to accomplish uh, providing a health benefit, sure. but in the meantime, they cannot also harm you in another way. Mm -hmm. So the uh, Food and Drug Administration is very, very stringent in the rules and regulations it has for medical manufacturing so that that edict of do no harm is lived up to. You know, uh, I think for a lot of people, when you go, just think about this for a second. Go into a hospital and when you go to visit a friend, uh, go look around you. Open your eyes to beyond just the experience that the patient is having. Consider the kinds of things that you're looking at. Every item in that hospital had to be designed and developed by uh, a company and then sold to someone within the hospital community from from the, the the trays to the bedside tables to all the pieces and parts from the IVs the uh, the way blood is stored every single small and major item from the big machines we talked about right to those little things are all manufactured Jim it, to me that's kind of like an underground industry where you, you didn't really realize uh, there's got to be catalogs and catalogs where uh, hospital directors have to go look at, and as we talked earlier, probably not just one item. You'd have to decide which of these uh, different brands would be most suit your particular application. In many cases, that's true. In many cases, uh, there are mature goods, you might say, uh, devices or products that have reached a level of maturity so that there is not one company making them. Um, in the innovative products and the newly introduced things, there are those proprietary products, mm -hmm. but many, many, many of them um, are more mature than that. 
And we're Americans, we like choices. Uh, we like choices in features, we like choices in size, we like choices in price. So there are options for the doctors, for the hospitals, uh, for whoever is buying these products. So um, manufacturing plays a role in that too. What features do you put into this wheelchair right. or this hospital bed or this scalpel or this uh, CAT scan machine or x-ray machine? Um, all those <clears throat> are determined by manufacturing and manufacturing is needed to uh, make those choices a reality. Well, it's, it's funny because when we talked about it earlier, you know, think about um, if you've ever gone and maybe tried to uh, outfit a wheelchair for someone in your family, uh, I didn't really realize that there's a consumer facing part of this industry. And Jim, uh, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, there are stores here in Detroit uh, that you could go to and when you walk in there, it's like a, any other kind of showroom. Uh, they have uh, choices, and depending mm -hmm. on your particular needs, there were uh, small companies. Uh, you mentioned a couple. I know one is right in Philippus. Benson and Benson. Benson and yeah. Benson. Okay, so these are consumer-facing places yes. where if we know the particular item that we need, we can go there and purchase that, whether it's through insurance or, or out of right. pocket. Right, right. So, so it's not just the hospital setting. No, no, it is not. Um, I'll give you an example. My, uh, my son injured his knee playing sports when he was in high school and had to uh, have an operation on, on one of them. And uh, as a result, he wound up getting crutches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carl is six foot four. I am not. You can't tell sitting down, but I'm a long way from <laughs> six four. Uh, recently, I injured my leg and thought it would be a good idea to get around with crutches for a day to let things heal. And so I said, well, those are down in the basement. Go get them. Well, they're adjustable. They're really cool. Yeah. But you <laughs> the shortest position is too, too so, tall So for instead me. of getting around crutches, you became a pole vaulter. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> but the point being that, that is, that's an example of the choices that are available yeah. to the consumer. Yeah. Back when I was Carl's age, all they had were wooden crutches or, yeah. you know, wooden legs. And, and now uh, what's being done with uh, replaceable orth orthopedic parts for the body is, is truly amazing. It is amazing. And when uh, you think about that, uh, the war in Iraq has um, really brought that home for a lot of people. There are uh, some absolutely amazing inventions when it comes to uh, medical devices that help us live our lives a little easier. And part of that has been a limb replacement, but um, when we talk about a knee or a joint replacement, I know a lot of people in our families have had these operations. These devices are, are really sophisticated and they're yes. not used or made from items that are commonly available. These are um, high-tech, uh, either rare metals or high-tech plastics. Uh, and, uh, talk about a little bit about what the manufacturing industry has to do to make something like that. One of the big advances in devices like this has to do with materials and learning how to work with these materials in manufacturing. They have some very specific properties, titanium and, and advanced ceramics. And the ceramics are, we're not talking pottery here, we're <laughs> talking about the stuff like uh, what you would find on a space shuttle. Uh, they provide some lubrication for a knee joint and a strength to hold up the body. But you need some very, very specific, very sophisticated machines to be able to shape these yeah. and then put them together. So uh, the, the machines that do this are computer controlled. It is amazing. Factories are no longer the dirty, greasy, grimy, dark places they were before. <laughs> to make these things, you put a piece of, of blank stock into a cabinet uh, you close the door, it programs, and uh, these various tools come from many directions, to put it very simply, and, uh, and shape and mold and remove material to the right form. Wow. And some of them uh, can even attach parts and assemble pieces before, uh, before the part has to be taken out of the cabinet. Well, truly, if you are a, a, a student of medical history or if you go to the Henry Ford Museum and see some of the early science involved in, uh, in things like uh, uh, you know, limb replacement items, you've seen we've come a long way. Uh, titanium, plastics, and Jim, these are precision-made items that, that cost many thousands of dollars, but they have to because when you think about 
something implanted in your body, you don't want to have be replacing that thing like a set of batteries. You, you right. want that thing to last 10, 15, 20, 30 years so that you can have some kind of quality of life. So you're saying that, uh, that that's a whole other separate section of this manufacturing industry, just making, having the tools to make the medical items. Yes. Um, if you are working with titanium, <laughs> you need a machine that is going to resist the vibration of the removable removal of metal yeah, from the smooth. titanium. Mm -hmm. So these machines are mounted on blocks of granite to dampen that vibration. Titanium is extremely, extremely hard. And when you work it, it throws off a lot of heat, mm -hmm. which has an effect on the tool that you're using on it. So uh, then you need what's called through the drill uh, coolant, mm -hmm. where coolant is introduced in the process of, of machining. Uh, sophistication you know, is incredible. Here's what's fascinating to me, that the things that you're talking about, when you talk about your yearbooks with the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, that kind of uh, knowledge base, that kind of engineering is a effective also in aerospace. Yes. The things, you know, think about the military applications of when they make things uh, for airplanes out of titanium, they have to have that. So they're related. The automotive industry, the kind of engineering of machine tools um, and, and for mass marketing and manufacturing of things. All these things are kind of interrelated, and people, when they think of manufacturing, they don't think of the medical industry as being a player here. But clearly, not only does it stand alone as its own industry, Jim, these are all kind of interrelated. This so an engineer with some expertise in, say, automotive, yes. he could actually apply his, his trade somewhere in the medical industry. You find that to be true? Yes, and in effect, uh, or in fact, uh, the, the MEDC, the Michigan Economic Development uh, corporation, I believe it is, the C, um, about three years ago, mm -hmm. in the light of the declining yeah. auto industry around here, said, you know, we have all these people, we have all this manufacturing ability, we have brilliant engineers, we have the machines, we should be in medical manufacturing for a number of reasons. Yes, we have the talent, we have the capital investment, we have the people, we need the jobs. But two, uh, People are living longer, they're growing older, medical science is advancing, so there's so much more we can do. It's a growing market. It's right. one that's going to be there. Uh, we can live long enough where maybe it's a, a good idea that we don't drive anymore, but I think we all want to be able to walk. Yeah. So if we have people out there um, designing, developing, making better hip implants, knee implants, uh, then we're going to live longer, healthier, happier, more self-fulfilling lives. I got to tell you, I think it's fantastic. You know, Detroit has been really hit hard with the economic recession, especially in our auto industry. There are many, many great uh, trained engineers who, uh, in our in our areas, who've had to move out looking for other jobs. And as we've talked, uh, some other people have found new careers outside of engineering. And it's a shame that we don't have uh, more of this kind of uh, growth in this industry. I think Detroit could be uh, a very uh, center for medical manufacturing if only we could somehow get people uh, more uh, thinking on this realm and maybe get engineers back. Is there is there an active way to get people involved, say an automotive engineer who's now out of the business and maybe go into, uh, think about going into medical manufacturing? Is it something that they they uh, learn to interface within the society, maybe in meetings? They, they can learn that. We do have a job posting on our website, a mm -hmm. list of job openings that uh, companies uh, bring to us so that they can find qualified employees. Um, right now you see the, uh, the phone number and the, uh, the web address on the screen there, that www.sme.org. Check it out. We'll take you to SME's website. Mm -hmm. That phone number is right at my desk if you want to call and find out more about the society, more about the yearbooks, more about manufacturing. Please give me a call. I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, but please, no medical questions. I have never played one on TV. I don't You're pretend not a doctor? to have that. Oh, Dr. James. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, um, I, th I think you don't have to be a doctor to really kind of understand what we're talking about today. I think the issue, Jim, is really let's think about um, Detroit. Go back to the days where Detroit, you told me earlier that, that the Detroit does have a real good, strong medical history. And we started talking about some of the places that if you drive downtown, you might see that, um, is it the uh, Park Davis building? Park Davis. Now that was if one of the- If you've ever been to the Rattlesnake Cafe, 
right down uh, the river that's front? in the uh, the old Park Davis headquarters and uh, and plant so not only a, a pharma company but uh, medical uh, uh, pharmaceuticals were manufactured there for what, yes. many, many years. Many, many years, yes. So Detroit does have this, and I think about what's happened in the auto industry, the tool and die makers. Remember, uh, folks, when you could drive downtown and look at uh, when the auto industry is being supplied by many, many little shops, and many of those areas had moved out in the 60s, they moved to the suburbs, you saw many tool and die, um, lathe shops, whatever, they moved out. And then now with the automotive industry, the suppliers have become larger, they're, they're large corporations, but there are still many small suppliers, Jim, and, and are you saying that there, that kind of a cottage industry could spring up around um, former automotive suppliers? It, John, it already has. Michigan has a good number of contract manufacturers, job shops in effect, who, if you have an idea for a medical device, uh -huh. you bring it to them, they will help you with, finalize the design uh, establish the manufacturing process and make it for you. Right uh, here in Detroit? Right here in Detroit, in Michigan. Uh, even in the Upper Peninsula, there's a company in uh, Marquette called Frontier Medical, uh, I believe it is. And yeah, Frontier Medical in Marquette, they are a contract shop for this, uh, for this work. Uh, we have a, one of the biggest uh, medical device manufacturers in terms of orthopedics here mm -hmm. in Michigan, Stryker in Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. uh, ATEC out in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids area is a huge area for making and developing medical devices. And then again here in the Detroit area, um, Jack Rausch coming out of the auto industry oh, absolutely. now has Rausch Life Sciences and that. they will help you design, develop, and manufacture. It's a long list here. Diagnostic devices, mm -hmm. you know, you take a temperature, uh, pregnancy <laughs> test, whatever. Uh, medical devices, more traditional. Drug delivery, so whether it's, it's an IV, an implantable uh, time release capsule, uh, or lab products, uh, Rausch Enterprises can help you with that. I cannot believe that for, as a kid, Jack Rausch meant uh, you know, racing cars, and today, you, you guys, if you watch the NASCAR race at MIS, uh, Roush Fenway Racing had several teams in it. Roush had been a supplier to many of the big three and to Ford for many, many years, and his engineering expertise got to the point where he said, man, I could make a living, and I could use this uh, manufacturing expertise to create a whole new segment of my, my, my world there. It's amazing, Jim, to me. Yes. It really is. Uh, one thing we've got to talk about is uh, this stuff doesn't happen in a vacuum. And, and folks, you know, when you talk about your kids getting into something, when you talk about creativity, uh, some people think that creativity is only in music or in the arts, and their kids may be, uh, you know, great uh, uh, with a drawing pad. But there's another part of creativity we should talk about, and that's this ability to, to fix and make things. And I think Detroit has, with Wayne State University and some of our other uh, major universities, should uh, pretty much well be known for a, a center for engineering excellence. Jim, can you address a little bit of that? Is, are, there, are there real engineering communities in our education system here? Yes and no. Uh, yes, because they exist, because we teach engineering in this area. Yeah. No, because we do not teach the basics, the foundational courses that lead to engineering or manufacturing exp expertise mm. early enough. Uh, I get to travel all around the, the country. I talk to, uh, to people at trade shows and a lot of these trade shows have kids in high school or just out of high school uh, who are taking machining classes, who are working with some of the most phenomenal devices for additive manufacturing, which is a whole different topic we could get into, <laughs> and it applies to medical. Mm -hmm. um, but they have these machines right in their schools. I don't, I'm not aware that we have that here. We may, but uh, we're not making a big deal about it. We are focused on the uh, get your, yourself, your kids out of the factory, into college, right. into management. Mm. Um, I think we're seeing that that's not necessarily the best career path for everyone. Correct. And uh, again, it's a matter of choice. Yeah. Manufacturing has changed. I, I think it's really important for us to start thinking about manufacturing and its role in our society because I think what's happening is when we see everything we open up made in China, uh, when I see something that says made in China, I see job in China. 
And I know that not just for my own kids, but um, many people that I know, some kids just that they, that educational um, getting a master's degree goal is not part of their chemical makeup. Uh, some people are better in the trades, and some people you need people in the trades. Trust me, you need good builders and and good plumbers and good electricians. You also need people who are great engineers. And uh, sometimes I don't think we think about uh, engineering and education in that way. Sometimes we think about engineering as uh, an applied science and something that we can always farm out later. But it is, I think, a great place for someone who's just got a knack for wanting to fix things, wanting to, uh, you could call them problem solvers. They yes. see something in a different light, Jim. And I think that uh, many of our children don't even look at that avenue as something they do because it kind of push toward the service world and the service industry as we're starting to push manufacturing out of our lives. Well, you need to make things. We, d we don't have flat screen TVs. We don't have hip replacements, we don't have x-ray machines without this. The, the bad thing is, yes, manufacturing is going offshore. Mm -hmm. The good thing is, the manufacturing that is staying here tends to be the very high technology, advanced, precision manufacturing that takes a lot of education, yes, but it takes a lot of imagination and creativity. And I think that's something that appeals to young people today. They, they want to be creative in so many ways. They have so many opportunities. Here's another way, uh, and these are tools to being creative. Math and science are tools to get you to an end. That's yeah, it's so important, and I again, I think everyone out there needs to start thinking about how important manufacturing is. You know, we've heard from our politicians, uh, we've got to somehow go, become less dependent on manufacturing and making things and more dependent on the service industry. I think talking to you, Jim, today, we found out that you know, even the service industry has tools and things that we need. You know, Jim, we're already out of time. Uh, and we really have to have you back. We can talk more about this and all the other things that we're really kind of famous for when it comes to manufacturing, but I, uh, we have to go. So I wanted to, again, thank you for your time today. It's been a real special treat to have you, and I appreciate John, what you brought to the table thank you. here. No, our pleasure. I would love to be back. We will have you back. And in the meantime, I think everybody else needs to realize that uh, when you think about oh, America becoming a service society, thank goodness we have people that uh, smart engineers to make the things that we use and, and have in, in our lives every day. And sometimes not just those things, but the machines that make those things. So I hope we've uh, picked up a little bit about that. Tell your politicians that we need manufacturing here in America. So that's about all for now. Uh, remember, knowledge is power. I'm your host, John Clore, and thanks for watching. <laughs>